like to introduce uh, Ryan Sterry. He's a fellow ag educator and he joined Extension in 2006, serving roles in the dairy, farm management, and livestock programs. He's currently a regional dairy educator for Barron, Pierce, Polk, and St. Croix counties in northwestern Wisconsin. His work includes the development of corn silage pricing program, beef and dairy production, assessing costs to raise replacement dairy heifers, and as a resource for our team on reproduction topics. Ryan received a bachelor's uh, degree from UW River Falls and a master's degree from UW Madison. And we would like to welcome uh, Ryan here on our Badger Dairy Insight webinar series to talk about beef and dairy crossbreeding and calf management practices on Wisconsin dairy farms. Welcome, Ryan. Thanks, Angie, appreciate it. Hopefully everybody can see my screen, if not ill. Um, Otherwise, uh, we'll continue on with um, the rest of our BDI session here. So what I'm going to be presenting today are the results of an on-farm survey that we conducted uh, late 2021. Um, so I just want to recognize the uh, extension educators that were the boots on the ground working with the local farms in their area to help collect uh, this data. So uh, this report and survey uh, would be available to us. So this is a companion. We did a similar survey looking at beef and dairy genetics uh, in 2018. And the results of that survey are available on our uh, Extension Livestock Program page. Uh, we are working on a written summary of this report. Um, hopefully we'll be getting that posted soon. Uh, so I can tell you, you are the first audience that's seeing uh, any of these results. So with that uh, brief, outline uh, some of the things that we want to cover today. I'm just going to be presenting highlights. There are 46 questions on the survey. We aren't going to go through all 46 questions uh, today, but greater detail is going to be available in that summary report uh, that uh, is uh, almost done. We're almost there. So with that, the survey questions kind of fit nicely into six general categories, and that's how we split out today's presentation. Those are sort of some general information about the farm, breeding information, uh, which we summed up of how cows and how the bulls are selected, breeding data, which is a little different. It's more about who was selected and conception rates, then newborn calf management, milk feeding practices, and we'll wrap up uh, with the marketing practices of our farms. So first we're gonna start with general farm information, just the average production, herd size, and some culling information from uh, our participants. So that we surveyed 40 farms, all farms are in Wisconsin. We wanted to make efforts to survey a wide range of herd size. We wanted to uh, be representative of the wide range of herd sizes we see within the state. So with that, this over just a little bit. Uh, so with that, we can see uh, a breakdown of our participants by herd size here. We broke them into several categories. So of the 40 farms, six had fewer than 100 cows, four farms had 100 to 200 lactating cows, 11 farms had 201 to 500 cows, 12 had 500 to 1,000 cows, and seven farms had over 1,000 cows. So overall, the average herd size was 735 cows. Our smallest survey herd was 19 cows, and the largest was 7,414 lactating cows. Just a quick snapshot of the average production of our survey farms. Uh, average daily milk was 85 pounds per cow per day, and it ranged from 47 to 108. Components average of 397 fat, and that varied from 3.1 to 4.96. Protein average 3.14% and ranged from 2.85 to 3.73% protein. The average ME 305 day milk was 29,303 pounds, and that ranged from 18,000 pounds up to 36,500 pounds. Next, we want to take a, spend a little bit more time looking at culling rate. So culling rate is an important factor influencing herd dynamics and replacement dairy heifer needs. So the culling rate for lactating cows, um, there's a wide range here, but average 29.9%. So not far from that 30% that Dr. Fricke just mentioned, um, which is down from the days we're talking about 40, 45%. Our non-lactating heifer culling rates, 
averaged 7.6%. That ranged from zero to 60%. I can tell you that 60% is an outlier, but it's worth talking about and reflects a little bit how the dynamics have changed in the dairy industry uh, because we're pretty confident that farm from the other data we gathered, they were at facility capacity, if not a little past it, they weren't planning to expand. So they were going through a heifer reduction exercise at the time we were doing the survey. Next, we're gonna take a real brief look at the number of dairy heifer calves, and the number of beef times dairy crossbred calves that were born annually on our participating farms. The average number of dairy heifer calves born per year was 317, and that ranged from none to over 2,300. The average number of beef times dairy crossbred calves born per year is 454, with a low of one and high of 6,200. Now, of course, these numbers, it's all relative, right? It's all relative to what the herd sizes were. But we still thought this was worth noting and presenting because it does show that some farms are producing a significant number of uh, beef on dairy crossbred calves. And if we're going to start talking about marketing and single sourcing, that can be done in the hundreds, if not in the thousands of numbers per farm. So we did think that was a little interesting uh, result of the survey. So next we're gonna get a little bit more into the data and take a deeper look at the decision process of participating farms used to select which dairy females got bred to beef sires and how those beef sires were being selected. Farmers were asked how many years they had been using beef sires in their herds. The average is five years and it ranged from a low of two years to a high of 20 years. Five farms had two or less years of experience using beef sires, 14 at three to four years, Another 14 also had five to six years of experience, four had seven to eight, and three had nine or more years. So the vast majority fell within that three to six years of using uh, beef sires on their dairies. Participants were also asked to rank criteria used to select the number of cows and heifers bred to beef sires. Farms could rank all the criteria that applied to the farm. They could select more than one. So without getting too far into the weeds and commentary, we hear a lot about calf prices, about you know a beef times dairy cross calf is worth X dollars more than a Holstein bull calf or a Holstein heifer calf. And that can really draw our attention sometimes, but we don't want to lose sight that replacement heifer needs are the main driver deciding how many cows and heifers are to be bred to beef sires. So 70% of our farms in this survey ranked uh, that as the determining factor in how many cows and heifers are bred to be sires. 7% also noted they do look at dairy calf prices as a factor, and 20% indicated beef times dairy crossbred calf price was an important factor. So they're factors, uh, but we also we can't lose sight that the increasing use of beef on dairy is also tied to dairy heifer management uh, and managing those numbers, right-sizing the number of replacement heifers that we're raising uh, and trying to make those economics a little bit more favorable in our advantage. So for this particular question, we had several other factors that participants brought up. So 37% listed another consideration. The full list is gonna be in the white paper. I'm not gonna go through all of them now, but we did lump them into general categories of service number and days of milk was considered. Certain farmers wanted more beef times dairy crossbred calves. Decisions on breeding cows versus heifers, which essentially comes down to, are we breeding heifers or breeding older cows? We're gonna talk about this a little bit later, but heifers might be preferred for dairy semen and the older cows preferred for beef semen. And then a few other miscellaneous things came up there. Next, we're going to look at the data used to calculate heifer needs. Culling rates and pregnancy rates for both cows and heifers are key factors that are going to impact the number of replacement heifers each farm needs to produce annually. So to be sustainable farms, they, we have to maintain a certain influx of replacements if we're going to maintain herd size, maintain production. But as Dr. Frick was just talking about, some of the improvements that we've seen in recent years, we're talking more and more about what's that right number and not raising too many either. Cow culling rate was the most selected factor by survey farms with 65% of farms responding that it is a consideration in determining the replacement heifer needs. Heifer culling rate and her pregnancy rates were each ranked by 50% of the farms. 
55% also indicated some other things that were in play here uh, from some of the comments that were added to the survey. These other factors, they varied widely, and we had a hard time lumping them into categories. But I can tell you from some of the feedback, some herds indicated wanting more heifers, either because they were planning an expansion or they had a market for selling replacement heifers. Some farms were on the opposite end of the spectrum. They didn't want any more heifers, either to the space limitations or we know a couple of little survey farms are looking at using beef on dairy as part of their exit strategy or transition strategy from the dairy industry. Within the other category, consultant did come up. So we split that out and made a separate line for it here. Um, consultants were either from the AI or the animal health industries helping their clients determine the right numbers here. Brian, as you're moving through your slides, a question came up about why um, are some farms breeding 100% of their animals to beef? Do they feel like um, they can concentrate better on their cows or um, that the replacement costs for heifers when they're moving forward in their operation is at a, at a price that's cheaper than raising heifers? What are you seeing or did anybody mention any of that in the survey? Some of both. So I'm glad you asked that because the first time I was showing this to a colleague, they saw that um, her breeding 100% to beef and they're like, that's an outlier. You got to kick them out. It wasn't just an outlier. There's a few others in there as well doing that or close to 100%. So I think the factors you just brought up are very valid. We do hear that out there. Um, I'm just trying to think back to other things we saw in the survey. Uh, again, part of that transition phase of um, either adding another enterprise to the farm um, or a farm looking to retire might be more heavily on the beef side of things as part of that farm transition. Um, and again, I, you just touched on it, but a few of them for choosing not to re raise their own replacements. Um, again, most likely due to a cost factor. Um, so yeah, um, I can tell you with confidence that it wasn't just an outlier that we did see that on a few farms that were um, either breeding all to beef or close to it. So good questions. So kind of continuing on along those lines, participants rested and a fine rank and order importance of criteria um, used to select which cows and heifers were going to get bred to be sires. Again, farms could select more than one response. AI service number was the most frequently identified response by 29 of the 33 farms that answered this particular question. Uh, parent average predicted transmitting ability was selected by 21 farms lactation number by 17 farms, and genomic PTA by 16 farms. So several factors here are getting considered, um, but that service number was the leading factor. They were also asked to rank those criteria in order of importance, and the results for that uh, were very similar to the overall ranking. So of the 28 farms that did the ranking, 18 selected AI service number as their number one or number two most important consideration. 12 farms ranked parent average, 10 farms ranked genomic PTA, and then eight farms ranked lactation number as their first or second most important factor there. Again, we ran into some of these other uh, things written in or side notes that farms provided to us. Um, so if we kind of just do some general themes there, production did come up, health did come up, uh, type confirmation also came up there as considerations. We asked our farms which beef breeds they're using as sires, and I know Dr. Fricky just showed a similar uh, slide from a much larger data set, but again, we thought uh, this would be interesting to do in the survey as well. Farms could select more than one response, so some farms are using one single beef breed. We also ran into seller farms that were using multiple beef breeds. It's not just all one or all the other. So similar to our previous survey work, Angus was the most popular beef breed used with 34 farms reporting using Angus. That said, there is a wide variety of breeds getting used out there. Uh, seven of our farms are using Simmental, eight were using Sim Angus, eight were using Limousine. We had one farm using Limflex, and then five farms using Wagyu. Uh, Charlay and Hereford were right in comments that also received with one farm each using those two 
breeds. I'm not going to present it today because it's a little messy um, data to look at, uh, but we'll include it in the paper. But we also looked at the percent of each breed used within those herds. Uh, so I can tell you, like when we look at the way U5 farms are using it, but none of our survey farms are using 100% Wagyu. They're breeding um, a certain percent of their herd to Wagyu and then using another beef breed to complement that, if that makes sense. You want to gain a little more insight into who was making the beef sire selection decisions on the farm. The leading response was the AI representative by 21 farms, followed by the farm owner manager for 16 farms. The calf buyer did pop up uh, by two farms. Uh, they were collaborating with their calf buyer to make those decisions. And then we had one other, and that one other was uh, they were working with their consultant. The consultant was making the recommendation uh, of which beef sires to be using. Just real briefly, uh, since we're going through all this data, it's like, hey, what, you know, let's ask what they're paying for it too, just to get a quick snapshot uh, there. Uh, and we broke that down into three categories, conventional dairy, sex semen, uh, dairy, sex dairy semen, excuse me, as well as beef semen. So probably not too surprising, farms are probably paying more for sex dairy semen with the average cost of $31 per unit, and that range from 15 to $50. So again, wide range, um, and that's what we would expect to see. Conventional dairy semen averaged $18 per unit and ranged from $7 to $30, and beef semen averaged $10 per unit and ranged from $1.40 to $30 per unit. We asked our participants to rank in order of importance of beef sire selection traits that they were using on their farms, and they could rank all the criteria that apply to their farm. They could select more than one. So we're gonna start off with what we kind of coined the three C's as the leading selection traits, conception rate, calving ease, and cost. Conception rate was the most frequently selected response by 28 of the 36 farms, followed by calving ease by 24 farms and cost by 21 farms. And again, we also looked at how they ranked those criteria, if it was their first or second most important selection criteria. And again, very similar results. 23 out of 31 farms that ranked selected conception rate as their first or second most important factor, followed by 17 farms ranking calving ease and 11 ranking cost. So here we got a snapshot of the other selection traits that we served our, surveyed our farms on if they were using them as a consideration uh, or not. So they included growth, carcass, uh, and other performance traits. So while far, some farms reported factory and feedlot and carcass performance, it appears we still got some opportunities out here to emphasize those traits more to try and breed a better crossbred animal. And how do we incentivize uh, premiums, uh, benefits of that between um, our buyers and sellers. So muscling rib by area was, this was selected by eight farms. Eight farms are also looking at weaning and yearling weights. A terminal or all-purpose beef sire index was used by five farms. We also had five farms using frame score in five farms looking at the marbling EPD. The three other responses that showed up were, were the AI rep had knowledge of those selection traits being used, but the farm owner or manager that was being surveyed did not have knowledge of the selection traits used. Again, we looked at how those were ranked in order of importance, if they were the first or second most important selection criteria, and again, those rankings are pretty similar uh, to what our overall rankings here were. So we're gonna change gears here just a little bit and look at semen allocation based on lactation number and conception rates on our cows and heifers, as well as split out by the type of semen used. We did ask how many, times cows and heifers received AI before switching to beef sires. And the average was 2.9 services for heifers and 2.3 services for cows. We did have a wide range here from one to five on heifers and zero to five on cows. Or kind of relates to Andrew's question there, if some farms are using all one or the other. Um, so we'll talk about this a little bit in conception rate. Uh, but I do think it's worth noting because we do kind of repeatedly see this thing come up. So Dr. Fricky previously was talking about the conception rates for beef semen versus dairy semen. If we're just pulling up records on a single farm, trying to do a quick analysis, we also got to look at service number two. 
So it's a real common practice to use dairy first service or dairy first and second service. And if they don't settle to that, they're getting beef, no matter how good, you know, what cow it is, if it's our favorite cow or not, there's a switch that happens there. So if we're just pulling up the conception rate for beef semen versus dairy semen, but we have this difference in service number, it's not an apples to apples comparison anymore. And so we do have to be conscientious of that, that we're not making uh, an unfair or uneven comparisons and looking at beef on dairy, beef or dairy, excuse me, conception rates, if we got this difference in service number here also occurring. We got uh, we got to factor that in, we're looking at our individual farm data. So we looked at lactation and semen use. So farms reported a percent of heifers, first lactation cows, and second greater lactation cows bred by semen type, again, broken out um, by conventional sex dairy or beef semen. So here we're looking just at the beef semen breeding data. It was reported to be used in all lactations. Second and greater lactation cows saw the greatest use of beef semen, averaging 60% of breedings followed by first lactation cows that just under 42% of breedings and heifers were 18% uh, of breedings reported to beef on the heifers for our survey farms. And so we included the ranges here just to recognize different farms are doing different things. So if you look at an individual farm basis, we do see a wide range there. But take home on average, more beef semen is getting used in the older cows and kind of the sliding scales we go to younger cows and to heifers. If we look at sex semen use, invert that opposite. Um, again, broken out by heifers for lactation cows and older cows. Percent of sex semen use on heifers was the greatest, 58% of breedings, followed by 26% of breedings to first lactation cows, and 10% of breedings on second and greater lactation cows. I think there's a question that came up uh, at the end of the presentation, you know, using our older cows. Again, you know, we're just kind of a little snapshot here. Um, not, yeah, um, just kind of doing a snapshot here. Uh, it is getting used in the older cows, um, but on average 10%, but we did see a wide range of zero to 40% uh, and zero to 80% on first lactation uh, cows. So there might be farms using heavier, heavier amount of sex semen on those cows, but on average, we're still looking at 26% and 10% use. Farms were asked to self-report conception rates based on semen type. Um, it's really important to note, this is a small sample size for looking at fertility. Uh, so we're just showing this for discussion purposes. Dr. Fricky's data is a much larger data set and is gonna be more reliable for looking at those conception rates. But if we're gonna make a general comment, we did see greater fertility in the heifers, which we would expect. They average 60% conception to bee semen, 57% to conventional dairy, and 54% to uh, sex uh, dairy semen, excuse me. For cows, average conception rate to beef semen is 47%, conventional dairy was 46%, and for sex dairy semen is 42%. So we're gonna change gears from talking about conception rates and talk a little bit about uh, the newborn calf management practices on these farms. So this is a little bit newer data that uh, we started digging into compared to maybe some of our other research projects uh, and survey work. Specifically, we asked farms if beef and dairy calves are managed similarly to dairy heifer calves and a very similar question, if the navels of beef and dairy crossbred calves are disinfected, showing these on the same slide because we got the exact same answers to both questions. 87.5% of farms answered yes, to both questions, that's a pretty high percent. Next, we're gonna look at calf vaccination, neonatal vaccines given to pre-weaned calves. So here we can see half farms indicated they were vaccinating, half were not. To get a clear picture of early calf life, to do that, to accomplish that, by comparing the calf managed practices, we're gonna look at farms retaining ownership of those calves versus the ones that are marketing young calves. So if we get this to pop up here, 30 farms marketed most of their calves at two weeks or age or less. And we did have 10 survey farms that were retaining ownership six weeks or greater. Some were retaining ownership on the finish. So as we can see here, farms retaining ownership 
up to or past six weeks of age are much more likely 100% of them to administer those needle natal vaccinations versus the farms that those calves are leaving at a much younger age. So logically, we can kind of make some assumptions that farms retaining ownership are the most likely to realize the benefit of that neonatal vaccinations versus the farms that weren't retaining ownership. However, there's a lot we don't know about this. We don't want to pass judgment without knowing all the details. So really, this is a case-by-case -case specific decision for each farm. That's going to be based on what products are you using, where are those calves going to be going, and what's that calf's age. So for example, as we started digging into this amongst ourselves, um, you have to remember, like most vaccines, um, we don't think about this, but um, always look at the label. Some do have a withholding. That's where I was trying to go with that. So depending where those calves are going, you might need to pass out that information. If they're going to a sale barn, if they're giving any products with a withholding, that's definitely something that we don't want to uh, be doing. So, um, so we don't want to pass judgment here. We just want to point out that farms retaining ownership are much more likely to vaccinate those calves in that decision to do so. It's very case by case. Uh, but it's definitely something we want to dig more into uh, and something that needs to be looked at a lot more closely across the industry. So in related note, we want to look a little bit at the classroom and milk feeding practices. We asked our farms how soon after birth their beef on dairy crossbred calves received colostrum. 95% reported feeding colostrum within six hours of birth and 5% uh, were between six and 12 hours. So all farms were feeding colostrum 12 hours or less. We also asked about the amounts of colostrum being fed. 67.5% reported feeding at least four quarts. But that means we got 30 some farms that were feeding something less than that. So based on these results, it appears that farms are feeding colostrum in a timely manner. However, the feeding rate on uh, some of these farms, you might have to do a little further and guess investigation if that is an adequate amount or not. Um, now we do need to go back and look at this day. There might be some farms that were splitting those feedings out and that's why they might appear lower. Uh, but again, the recommendation, we wanna be feeding four quarts. If we're feeding less than that, we need to start having some conversations about uh, cluster management for these beef on dairy crossbred calves. So looking at some uh, amounts in feeding frequency, on average farms fed 2.7 quarts of milk or milk replacer per feeding, but there's a wide range in these amounts. Uh, most farms fed twice daily, but we did have some farms indicate that they're feeding the crossbred calves three times a day as well. So some of these numbers might be skewered lower because we had some calves leaving the farm at a very young age. Uh, so we do have to keep that in mind when looking at these numbers. Farm seeding milk replacer asks for the composition of that milk replacer and how much you're feeding. On average, the composition was 20% fat, 23% protein. The fat ranged from 18 to 25% and protein from 28%. So we did have a, quite a range here in more conservative versus more accelerated calf uh, growing programs that uh, farms were implementing here. Ounce of the milk replacer fed average 11.7. And so conversation with Dr. Akins as we we're going through the data here, um, we kind of figured out based on average feedings per day and average ounces of milk replacer fed, this is going to equate out to 1.25 to 1.5 pounds of milk replacer powder per day on average. So in the home stretch here, uh, we're going to take a brief look at the marketing practices on our farms. So farms reported at what age the majority of their crossbred calves were marketed. And again, farms could select more than one response. 26 farms marketed at less than one week of age, four at one to two weeks of age, one at two to eight weeks of age, four at eight weeks to one year, and five are feeding out to finish. So majority are marketing young calves, but we do see a wide range here. Again, uh, very farm specific. specific um, if they're raising to weaning, um, mid weights, uh, or feeding them all the way out. Our farms also reported which marketing channels they use to sell the crossbred calves. And again, they could select more than one response. Auction was most common. 
response used by 24 of our farms, but I was very closely followed by direct private sale by 22 farms. Four farms used a contract program and one farm in that other category uh, is retaining ownership till finish. Uh, and they were doing some direct retail sales with their beef on dairy crossbred calves. So the number of farms using direct sales and contract programs shows us again, this potential for enhancing communication between um, the beef times dairy calf producer and seller where these calves are going to. So again, trying to emphasize what ways can we forward that calf's genetic information and health records from the dairy to their new homes. So just a few uh, highlights and conclusions for take home uh, messages and what we identified in our 40 survey farms. Replacement heifer needs are still the driver for the percent of the dairy herd available to be bred to beef sires. This is a, a heifer inventory management tool. Bee semen was used more prevalently in our older cows, second and greater lactation. The three C's keep coming up. Semen cost, conception rate, and calving ease in our beef sire selection. And so we keep looking for opportunities to say, can we slip in also some production traits as well? 87% of farms reported caring for their beef times dairy crossbred calves, the same as replacement dairy heifers, with the exception uh, into that vaccination that we just talked about. 95% reported feeding colostrum within six hours of birth, but we need to ask some more questions and dig a little deeper into the amounts being fed. And finally, opportunities still exist for beef and dairy crossbred calf producers and buyers um, on how we're going to communicate. So, well, thank with... you, Ryan. Um, I have a question uh, about your um, conclusions. Uh, you know, you had mentioned that 65% of the farms uh, sell their calves less than one week of age. However, um, the tendency to have those calves vaccinated are the producers that are keeping them on farm. So you mentioned the communication and in increasing that. And I wonder, are your thoughts that the producers would be able to get more premium for those calves if they communicate to those direct buyers and say, we, we gave them four quarts of um, high quality colostrum, we vaccinated them because we know, um, you know, we're not selling them to an auction barn, we're selling them to a direct market that that um, new owner would be able to have a healthier, stronger animal. So uh, do you think that is a also a takeaway that um, producers could work with their um, buyers a little bit more closely and, and that might be a way to get higher colostrum quantities of colostrum in those calves and get those calves vaccinated? Yeah, no, I think those are definitely good points. Um, Again, looking at how many we're doing direct sale, again, farms could select more response there. So I think there's a lot of doing some of both happening. But yes, any opportunity we can pass that health information along to the next buyer, help improve the reputation of that seller, uh, and hopefully improve the performance of those calves. That's always something we want to encourage people to do. Uh, and again, um, I kind of tripped over when I was trying to say it there, but um, but it's a very case by case specific decision there. I, I don't think we have the data we need to say there's a black and white vaccinate don't vaccinate. I think there's a lot of factors we got to look at there before saying anything like that. But it's definitely something interesting and something we want to look for a little closer at. Uh, the other thing, and I see Tina's name popping up on here, is our uh, calf and heifer uh, expert here on our dairy team. Uh, but within the recent years, uh, when you look at cluster management, uh, what's been determined um, for being acceptable for uh, successful transfer passive transfer of immunity has changed. So it used to be, you know, 10 was uh, the break even, you know, less than that was considered failing. If you got at least 10 into them, um, it was considered passing. Well, now there's four categories on that chart. And we're actually shooting for 24. Uh, so I don't think it's so much that, you know, farms are skipping over feeding these calves colostrum, but I think we got to ask more questions on, are, is the quality really what we think it is? Are we testing for quality? Is the amount really what we think it needs to be? Uh, because what was considered good enough five years ago, we know more today, and the standard has definitely been raised. 
Um, and that's for your dairy heifer calves as well, too. So um, you want to be looking at that colostrum management there more closely as well. Yeah, that's hey, uh, oh. Go oh, ahead, I'm sorry. Becky. I'm sorry, Angie. I just had a quick question. Ryan, very nice. I really enjoyed that, uh, that survey data. Um, did you happen to ask the question about sex beef semen? Just out of my own interest. Did you even ask that question? We did not. Um, and it didn't come up, even though I know we have talked about this. Um, so I think that's something to look at into the future. Um, and I guess I'll get in the weeds here, but one of the questions I've had and get your thoughts on it too, I think there's probably a time and a place for it. Um, but I keep looking at that. Um, but we're also using the beef semen on these later inseminations as well. So where would you use that beef, sex beef semen? I don't know it's an all or none. I think there's places you use it. And I think there's cows that you go back to conventional. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think you're exactly right. I think it's limited use in certain situations. I think, uh, I think farms that retain ownership of those animals and can capture the say increased growth or yield grades of the different, you know, sexes of those calves can probably pencil that out to work. But you're right, you're going to be using beef semen on your older, less fertile animals. So you're taking an even bigger hit on fertility there and it's more expensive. So I know of I know of a couple of farms that are using sex beef semen, but they use it in a very targeted way and in a very limited way. Yep. But it's out there. I mean, it's worth bringing up. It is. It is out there, and it's available. It's just. I think you're right. I think it's just going to be limited to. I think you have to do some very, very careful calculations if you're considering using uh, sex beef semen. But the sex sex semen overall is, is uh, yeah, really really uh, picking up. And it's interesting. You know, we've we've talked about sex semen since the mid 1980s. It really wasn't until we got the high fertility in, in our lactating cows that we saw this dramatic increase in sex semen. So it's just been fun to watch. Well, uh, on behalf of all the listeners out there and dairy producers, um, egg educators and consultants, we really do appreciate uh, Dr. Fricky and Ryan sharing their expertise in, on these topics. And on um, behalf of a dairy farmer in Wisconsin, it's it's always enlightening to get the the chance and opportunity to listen and uh, learn and any any little bit to improve the efficiencies and um, bottom line of our operations is what we all strive to do, especially as the new year and making new goals and and setting budgets. So um, I would like to invite everyone. Uh, to take a look at the future Badger Dairy Insights that we're offering. They were just up on the screen Probably just not. a moment ago. And um, to consider registering for them, we have a lot of really exciting topics this um, spring to talk about. And um, the link to register is down below on the bottom. And um, some comments for the speakers that can't see the, the chats, um, just overall excellent presentation. So thank you everyone for joining. And until next time.